Hey, there we go. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it might be where you are out there. Welcome back to the live stream. My name is Jeff Fritz. This is C Sharp with C Sharp Fritz. Looks like I'm having just a little bit of a problem here this morning over on our YouTube connection. It looks like we lost it. It says we're online. Uh, I can't tell. I don't see anybody connected over there. How you doing over there, friends? On I see a couple folks connected in on Twitch. I'm trying to keep an eye on things on YouTube. It I I don't know what happened over here. Let me see if I can troubleshoot real quick and see what's going on. Um, yeah, we lost the connection to YouTube. Something happened and. I'm not sure. How you doing, uh, Ancient Coder Charles Galuli Rivon? Hello. Um, it says I'm broadcasting to YouTube, but I don't see anything over here. This is weird. Like literally nothing over there. Um, let me check the live studio thing over there. It says we're live now. And it also says it's unlisted. No, let's make that public. See if we can get folks tuned in. It says live now. And not sure. How you doing there in rainy Germany? Good to see you. Um, is it actually broadcasting? Ah, there we go. Now we should see some folks getting back online here. I'm not quite sure what happened, but we lost it. It's back. Yeah, there I am. That's me. Uh, let me post a quick message out to Twitter. Let's get folks back online. Uh, <laughs> uh, slight issues uh, with the connection to YouTube things are now online there we go there we go all right I'm feeling better about that now hey there we go there's Johnny B cat over on YouTube thank you so much um, that was weird I literally started broadcasting see it sending content over to YouTube but it just said sending data it didn't actually connect and show anything let me say hello to everybody over here in chat there's Johnny B cat Adonis uh, Adipos good to see you Charles Galuli ancient coder Rivon 09 sweaty Omar hello hello welcome in to all of you um as we get things yeah now now we're broadcasting now we're cooking with we're cooking with gas now all right How's it going out there, friends? Um, always fun dealing with uh, all of the the interesting things that could happen while we're broadcasting live on on all the internets, right? Um, so we're going to talk today. We're, we've been going through this is a very beginner friendly session, of course, and I, I like to position this more as developer talk radio. This isn't uh, a series of sessions here where you're going to be tuning in looking for the author authoritative information on something, but more for a discussion. Get folks the information they need so that they can be successful with, with C Sharp, with .NET. My hat today is from the Baton Rouge .NET and SQL Server user groups. Um, I was fortunate enough that they invited me to deliver a session to them a few weeks ago. And um, they they had a hat embroidered with their logo, and they sent it to me. So, as a as a salute to our friends in Baton Rouge, especially as they're they're going through and they're dealing with a hurricane landing there. Hope they're have, hope everybody in Louisiana, Baton Rouge, New Orleans. I hope you're all doing very well, and and that you're making it through this storm. So. Um, I, I salute you, and I hope you're everybody's doing well there. So, hello, Ab, uh, is it Abu Bakar in Sierra Leone? Um, Jaya Kumar in India. How you doing there, MK Farhad in in Ukraine? Hello, hello. Getting things 
warmed up here and making sure everybody's wandering in. Like to, I like to take a few minutes just at the beginning, welcome folks in, and and make sure that that we've got a little bit of an audience going here before I start in on today's lesson. Uh, Edberto, good to see you from Brazil. Welcome, hello, hello. Monterrey, Mexico is where uh, Jose is connecting in from. Thanks so much for tuning in. A little bit early out there in Monterey. My goodness. Thank you. I hope you have a fantastic breakfast. Have a little bit of coffee here while we're getting started. Let me get my gunners on so that uh, I can see the screens a little bit better here. So um, we've been covering, we've been doing all of this educational material using .NET notebooks. So .NET interactive notebooks are a tool that you can use to to write some .NET code, write a little bit of prose around it, mark up around your code to, to maybe describe what's going on, to provide some ways that you can test or interact with other data. And we're using .NET interactive notebooks, both online in a browser and in Visual Studio Code as a way to teach how you can use C Sharp. Um, hello to you in Egypt. Um, is it Muslim? Welcome in. Hello, Demiria. Welcome. Hello. Thanks so much, everybody, for tuning in today. Always, always a pleasure to be talking to so many folks from all over the world, uh, watching, learning together all about C Sharp. And the, please, um, all questions are welcome. Ask me anything. I am happy to stop, show you what's going on, peel back the covers, take a look at what's going on underneath, and at some of the things that are interesting. In our, in our notebooks, in our code that we're learning about. How you doing there, Codish, over on YouTube? Welcome in. So, the source code... Um, oh, haha, ha, Ryan. <laughs> um, of course, we're going to stay on topic with our questions. Things that are relevant and, and important to C-sharp, Visual Studio, Visual Studio code usage. The source code for everything that we're going through today, and of course... Everything is available online. You can reach out to the GitHub repository, interact with it. There's the link in chat, so you can you can click into it and, of course, get um, get the notebooks, get the material, get all the samples as we're going through them. And we're going to be in a notebook today called 0104 Loops and Conditionals. That's where we're going to be working. Online, hello to you, C137. Yellow? Why yellow? Yellow what? Um, first time tuning in, it says Ryan from Scotland. Looking forward to it. Fantastic. All righty. Hope oh, glad to hear it. Um, so we've got folks watching from YouTube. We've got folks on Learn TV. Let me keep an eye on Learn TV over there. I see a handful of questions coming in. Um, yeah, there, there we go. Yep. I was on, I was, it said it was broadcasting to YouTube, but I wasn't getting the connection coming back. Uh, verifying in with all the chat information. So we'll get that cleaned up. Make sure um, that the recording is all in fine shape over there. Um, when is the next Blazor video? Well, what would you like to know about Blazor? We've, we have we published a, a series of Blazor videos, Blazor 101 videos, 11 of them. I originally had 12, but the second and third one were so close in content that I decided to mash them together. So I ended up then renumbering videos four through eleven because they were supposed they were supposed to be four, uh, four through twelve. They ended up becoming three through eleven. It was like mm. so. Um, I definitely have some ideas for up upcoming Blazor videos. I have about six or eight that I want to put together, but uh, we'll see. We'll see. So uh, let me scroll through here. Copper Beardy, hello, welcome in, my friend. Um, Brent Morris from North Carolina is dialed in. You like the new Blazor series, Amal? Thank you so much. Appreciate the kind words, and I'm glad you're enjoying it. Um, while while I'm waiting for some more folks, let's uh, let's get some music playing here in the background. Of course, I like to play stream beats behind the scenes as we're as we're writing code, as we're learning together. Um, and where the heck did it go? I thought I had stream beats lo-fi here. I don't see Stream Beats Lo-Fi anymore in my playlists. What happened? No matter. We'll listen to Stream Beats Synthwave today. 
Now nah, we always start with that song. Let's go somewhere down here. Um, here we go. That's a good one. Um, let's start with this is a song called Moon Spelunking. There we go. This is Screen Beats from our friend Harris Heller. This is music that's designed to be royalty free, DMCA free. You can listen to it wherever you'd like. There's playlists out there for Apple Music, Amazon Music, Spotify. You can even download the songs if you'd like so you can listen to them wherever you might be. But they're groovy instrumentals that, that sound really cool behind the scenes for us to be listening to live while we're writing code. Um, I'll drop the link to... Sure, I'll drop a link to StreamBeats in chat. So StreamBeats.com has everything there if you're interested in listening downloading and uh checking it all out so thank you so much harris heller for making that music available for us to listen to while we write some code and learn together today you worked on an asp.net core project that depended on apis now i started creating reports using the dev express report builder cool data aggregated from multiple apis which makes your report slow is there any techniques I can use to enhance performance? If you're aggregating data from multiple services, when you make your request to those services, you're doing some sort of an HTTP client get async. You can have those asynchronous requests fire and instead of awaiting the get async, call get async and let the ta re you'll receive a task. Fire all of those commands, all of those GET requests to your services. After you're done firing all of those requests, do an await task uh, when all. That way, it will wait for all of those to be completed instead of make the first request, make the next request, make the next request. That's called in serial, right? Because you're making them one at a time and you're waiting for each one to be done. When you have async requests to web services, you can have them fire and run in parallel. So send all of those get async requests, wait for them all to be completed, and then continue your processing. That will help. It won't make it significantly faster, but you'll get those requests running in parallel, and it should improve. Um, yes, well, when all isn't necessary, necessarily parallel, when, when you say task dot when all, that says wait for all of these tasks to be completed. Uh, Hisamatsu over on Twitch asked a question. Uh, they're a beginner at programming. How can you master C sharp? What should you focus on? You're learning from W3C school. Well, W3 school doesn't. Do they teach C sharp? If you want to learn C sharp, if you want to follow and 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 get the basics of the language down and go in and and become become um it, it very uh, uh what's the word i'm looking for you want to you want to become you know uh it, very productive with c sharp check out um dot dot net and click the learn button up at the top and uh we can open this and take a look at this here on my desktop let's head over to there this is dot dot net and i click the learn tab up at the top and it will take you to this location. I'll share that link in chat. Click through. There are all kinds of tutorials about whatever type of application it is that you might be wanting to, to program with. Console applications, web applications, mobile applications, Internet of Things, cloud development, machine learning, all kinds of topics there. We even have links off to LinkedIn Learning, Microsoft Learn, our .NET 101 series. Somebody mentioned just a little bit ago my Blazor 101 series. All available for you out there. So you can go check that out and get started. Um, all kinds of learning materials here. So I definitely recommend that. W3 School does teach C Sharp. It's very basic. Well, depending on where you're starting at, you may need to start from the basics. But... We have, we, my team at Microsoft, has a fantastic collection of materials here for folks. Um, so, yes, the video series C Sharp with C Sharp Fritz on YouTube, um, which is where this should be. 
has all kinds of material uh, videos that we've gone through as well. Um, on YouTube, um, C137 asks, how is Android development with C Sharp? Do I recommend it? The only thing so far I did was Windows Forms with C Sharp and some small console apps. It's Android development with C Sharp is getting better and better. So, of course, we have all of our Xamarin tools that are available to you that you can use. Starting in November, you will have .NET MAUI available to you with .NET 6. And you'll be able to build and work with that. Now, .NET MAUI is just the next evolution of Xamarin as, as we bring together all of the .NETs under one umbrella, under one runtime, one framework that you can use everywhere. Behind the scenes, it's very much the same features and, and same capabilities. Um, another person new to C Sharp, yeah, dot, dot net slash learn, and that'll get you started. Of course, watching these videos every Monday, you'll find me teaching the basics, answering questions for all beginners, um, and, and continuing here. Why is my, why is my, uh, we're going to have a load of fun here today as I get paranoid about my, um, that's not my, there we go. My filters wait right down here. Can we clear that up just a smidge? That's better. That's better. That ah, looks better. I had looked like I had some gnats or something here. No, no, just the edge of the, of the chroma key. Uh, you want to make some money with you, some games with Unity? I'm sorry, you want to make games with Unity? Uh, yeah, learn a little bit of programming first. Unity, you're going to get into a lot of model building and, and, and layout and artwork in your scenes. And then you end up doing a bit of connecting the dots as far as making, uh, writing code that says how to instrument how those scenes and objects and actors in those scenes collaborate together. .NET MAUI is the, is the new, I wouldn't call it a Flutter alternative. I'd call Flutter an alternative to Xamarin because Xamarin's been around for 10 plus years. They, do, they try to do the same thing. So. Taking a look over here. Uh, nothing on Pubble. Fantastic. So. Um, Jonas on Twitch asks, um, let me head over, head back over to the chat. Uh, what do I think of UWP? So UWP, Universal Windows Platform, um, development model for building Windows applications, um, was intended initially to give a, a universal way to build things so, so that we had, um, our applications kind of in a standard look and feel for things, um, for things uh, uh, that were being built for Windows 8, Windows 8.1, Windows 10, um, and and it's kind of it, it's kind of grown and changed changed significantly with each model. To now, what we're seeing for Windows 10 and and soon to be Windows 11, something called WinUI. And honestly, I wouldn't develop directly against that when .NET Maui can target it and give you portability over to um, being able to recompile and have your same application run on iOS and Android. So UWP served its purpose for Windows 8, Windows 10. I would develop with .NET MAUI so that you still target, you still use, and deliver very nice, rich applications for Windows, but it'll also work on iOS, Android, and Mac OS. Uh, Soviet Doge asks, um, if I want to work with a database from C Sharp, should I learn Entity Framework or something like Dapper? Good question. I actually use both together in applications, and I'll tell you why. Entity, it, it, the new Entity Framework, Entity Framework 6, Entity Framework Core 6, I think that's what it is, um, is is very very fast almost as fast as dapper if not faster um and still lets you work with your objects and do link and have those 
interactions so that you don't have to think through so much with the simple SQL statements for CRUD and some of the other interactions you want to do. CRUD, create, read, update, and delete actions you may take with the database. So Entity Framework is very good at giving you those, those initial interactions. When you start getting into some more complex queries and interactions, it might make more sense to use Dapper to do those queries because there you will hit some limitations in Entity Framework because you're trying to query with some where clauses on exterior references, other tables that are included, and it gets a little bit tricky and messy to do with Entity Framework. It's possible, but it's trickier and messier. So I I recommend folks at use a little bit of both just because you're going to get some better interaction, some better code maintenance when you work with Dapper. And Entity Framework can give you some really good interactions as well. Have I ever used DBUp? No, I have not, Dimerio. Um, do you need to create a PDF in C-sharp? Can I tell you a good library for it? You know what? That's not something I've had to do for a while. Um, a PDF... Create a PDF from .NET. I know there's ways to print to PDF. Um, a bunch of the vendors, of course, have have reporting tools. Uh, Grape City, uh, Dev Express, uh, Progress, um, Infragistics, um, Aspose has has tools. There's a bunch of vendors out there that have tools that will help you do that. Um, Syncfusion. Just scrolling through here. I would go with one of them because they've got some really good um, capabilities there. Super Viking sa says, can't you just pass raw SQL to EF Core? You can. However, you need to be returning a type that's declared um, in your entity framework model. If you're selecting something that's a different shape than one of the tables and objects you've declared, you've hit a limitation at that point. How you doing there, PC nerd? Amal asks, does Entity Framework Core need a repository pattern? No. You can you can embed and work with Entity Framework uh, uh, directly. Another, uh, Andre W1000 asks, do I have to implement a repository pattern? Nope. Nope. I like to wrap it with that because in, in maturing brand new applications, um, that, that are going to have a long lifetime. I, I prefer to wrap my database interactions with repository pattern because if I change vendors and in a project I'm working on over on my channel, I've, I've changed database, uh, database provider now three times. So having that repository pattern has meant that I can change my data access layer and everything else still works. Um... C137 says for creating forms in C Sharp, you can use Crystal Reports and they are exportable as PDF. Yes, there's a bunch of report vendors out there. Yep, Crystal is another one. Um, let me see here. Congratulations, PC Nerd. Not a day of working in Blazor. Enjoy that. Um. Welcome, uh, Sadi, uh, Sadi Odogbison. Welcome. All right. Let's, uh, let's get turned over. Let's get dialed into today's session. So I am working in, uh, grab the notebooks, grab the notebooks. Let me head back over. There we are. Um, we are in the C sharp with C sharp Fritz. Uh, repository, I'm going to be working in 0104, loops and conditionals. If you want, you can open this up in your browser and jump right to it by using Binder. Click this button here, Launch Binder. You can clone and run this locally in Visual Studio Code if you'd like. And... Do you miss native features of Entity Framework Core if you wrap it with repository pattern? No. No. Um, you, you you end up not using Entity Framework directly in your web pages and your application. You end up querying your repository, which hands off and delegates those 
uh, those features appropriately. That's okay if you're in a if you're in a startup mode, if you're in a new application mode, and there's a possibility that you're going to be changing database providers. For an enterprise that has a, a long-term contract with, with your database vendor, SQL Server, you have SQL Servers and they're not going anywhere anytime soon, you don't need a repository pattern. Code directly against that SQL Server. So, there we go. So, you can open and jump right into the exact same notebooks here. Click on 0104 and you'll be in the same notebook that we're going to be working on with Visual Studio Code in just a little bit. Taking a quick look here, you used PDF Sharp at your old job, mostly open source, would be a good bet. There you go. There you go. So, all right. Let me get, let me get all the things here and turned over. I know it sounds slightly different when I switch to this microphone while I get ready to head over to the other set so we can actually step into the code Get the, the big chroma key scene set up, and uh, I, I look like a meteorologist over there um, giving you the weather report. Um, so, looking good. Uh, the link to the GitHub repo, I will share that link one more time. Um, there you go. There are a ton of samples in there. Um, and... and uh, the notebooks, There's and this is all content that I've written by hand, and uh, of course I wrote it by hand. No, I wrote it by thinking about it. This is all content that I've written for you, so that you can check out, you can interact with, and learn. And um, honestly, I've had some folks say, we need to turn this into an ebook. I don't know, maybe that's a thing. Let me head over to the other scene, to the other set over here. And we'll start getting into this. Let me see. Come on. I need my coffee. Gotta have coffee. Right? The lifeblood of a developer. Having coffee. I mean, that's a thing, isn't it? Isn't it? Ah, oh, there we go. Hey, how's it going there, friends? It's your friend. friend it's, it's your good buddy, .NET Jeff here. And let me see. Get uh, that all queued up. Caffeine-driven development, says Surly Dev over on Twitch. I agree. Coffee and dark theme, it's a lifestyle. I agree, Amal. It feels good. Um, Bodan on YouTube asks, do I use code spaces here? Um, we could, but I don't. Um, it's just easy enough for folks to, to download and interact with it here. Mike sounds good? Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for reporting on, on the sound. Glad to hear it. If caffeine, then code. Totally agree, one learner. Totally agree. Um, <laughs> um, our friend Kate Gregory, she's an MVP, a Microsoft MVP, uh, calls herself a device for converting caffeine into code, says Surly Dev. <laughs> uh, I... Uh, a friend in college said, what are we devices to convert pizza into code? Uh, I guess you change a little bit when you get older. I don't know anything about being old. I'm not old. Not old at all. I'm still 29. Right? Something like that. <laughs> Let me clear all the outputs here and we'll, we'll get things started. Today we're going to be talking about in C Sharp, loops and conditionals. Now, these are pretty standard things that you see in, in all the different programming languages. Whatever programming language you may have seen before, you're going to see some structures here that look and feel very similar to what you may have encountered in, in JavaScript or Python or what have you, Ruby, whatever you might have used before. So, right, we're, we're of course talking about these types of commands, for, while, do, if, switch, or case, right? You've, you've seen these statements in other programming languages, and, and for those of us that, that speak English first, makes sense. Very English-like commands that you're executing, right? And um, that's, that's kind of the purpose here, is make it easy for folks to understand and 
use these commands to control flow inside of your application. And you're going to have these running maybe inside of a property, maybe inside, and, but mostly inside of methods, like we learned last time, how you can build methods inside of your classes. So we're going to be learning a little bit more about how these are referenced, how they're built, some of the features that you can use with them to make your applications and, and build business logic, build those algorithms that are going to really be the foundation of how your application runs. Love the NASA shirt. Thank you. Thank you. I've had somebody said to me, oh, you can't wear NASA on stream. That's that's copyright. That's trademarked. No, NASA's NASA's word marks, logos and materials are are in the public domain. Um, they're a government organization. You are allowed to share and use them. So, um, level 52. How you doing there, geek girl? <laughs> You're only as old as you feel, says Surly Dev. Uh, Surly Dev says, right now I feel like a teenager when I get up in 40 minutes and walk across the room. Then I'll feel more like my real age. Ugh. Ugh. All righty, let's get into this. Sorry, no hat commands today. This is, I mentioned a little bit ago, this is a hat from the Baton Rouge .NET user group and SQL Server user groups. Um, they're, they broadcast their monthly meetings right now on Twitch. Um, but with the hurricane making landfall in Louisiana, big salute to those folks in Baton Rouge in New Orleans and wishing you and yours health, safety in this time while the hurricane is coming through. So I wanted to make sure I saluted those folks as, as they're quite literally weathering the storm. All right, let's get into this. Let's talk about our code. Let's talk about, let's talk about these statements and how we can do a little bit more processing in our applications. So we're going to start off talking about conditionals. There are two statement level conditional um, interactions in C Sharp. You've got if and the switch case statements. If statements, of course, you've probably seen this before, they can be combined with a number of else and else if statements to route code flow and interactions across branches of code. And I've got links to the official document right here. You can you can you can click that, right? I'm trying to I'm trying to click it with my point. No, it's not gonna work. Um, let's take a look at a at a simple if statement. Man, the scroll here in Visual Studio Code. Um, you can rerun this code clicking on the code and, and clicking play or control enter. So let's take a look at this. Real simple block of code. Um, let's grab the current number of seconds in right now, the, the, the seconds on the clock, and we'll display the current number of seconds right there. If the number of seconds is a multiple of two, Right now, we, we learned way long ago, two, three weeks ago, about the modulus op operator. And right here, we're going to say, if seconds modulus 2 equals 0. All right, so percent 2 says, if we divide by 2, what's the remainder? So the remainder, when we divide by 2, if it's 0, so it's an even number, then we're just going to display seconds are even. That's a simple test, and I put a little bit of space around the test here so that it was a little bit easier to read. Spacing in C-sharp doesn't matter. You can shrink that, make that whatever size you'd like, and I'll control enter to execute that, 0 0.2 seconds. You see the current number of seconds on the clock at the time I executed that was 36 seconds, and it's an even number. If I execute it again, it's 47, and it isn't going to do anything. There's nothing for it to do. Seconds are even. Well, there's, that's it. So it's not even, so it doesn't report anything. It just says uh, 47 seconds on the clock. Okay. We probably want to pivot and also output some information about, well, if the seconds are odd, what do we do there? Um, let me take a look here. Um, back at chat to catch up. TB Toaster asks, are my glasses prescription? They look comfortable. These are not prescription. These are um, Gunner's Lightning 360 glasses. They they are quite comfortable. They The thing for me that is they have this hook, the, the lightning bolt here, so they go over my temple and they're not squeezing my head with the headphones on. 
Um, <clears throat> hey, how's it going there? Rancid BG, hello. <laughs> Welcome, man. Yes. Oh, my goodness. That that was a long time ago. Woo. Yes, that's right. Jupiter Notebooks can run C Sharp, asks uh, Ornong Live 13. Oh, we saw it. It was originally designed to run Python, but you can swap out the kernel and run .NET. Okay. So we've seen how our if statement runs here. Um, let's do a little bit more here. So we, we place our test in parentheses here. The block that we want to run, if it succeeds, is in curly braces after it. So we can also omit those curly braces if we have just a single statement that we wanted to execute. This is, this is something you can do, but I don't recommend it. Let me show you why. So here, same exact scenario. Display current seconds. If the percent seconds, right? If mod, seconds modulus two equals zero, seconds are even. See how that's one line? That's nice. That's, I get this. This makes sense to me. Look at that. It's one line, real easy for me as a human to read this, right? Quite clearly, if this succeeds, then do this next line. Yeah, I like that. However, you can also put them on two lines. If seconds percent two, so if the remainder when we divide by two is one, display seconds are odd. Now, see how it's on a second line? I indented it just so that I can, I can see that this is related to that. You don't have to indent it. You can have it line up left justified with the if statement there. That's, that's up to you. You can make that configuration if you want. Those are strictly considerations for our human eyes to be able to consume it. Now, the problem with this, right? While that'll execute and, and it'll absolutely do its thing there i'm gonna i'm going to click the play button over here and you'll see current seconds 11 seconds are odd this will always execute even though it looks like it's in the if statement and this is the problem right you can do this i don't recommend you do this when you put your if statement and you don't use the curly braces to denote a block right while this is really nice for us to read. This can be confusing because if you put another line somewhere underneath of it and you indent it as well, it looks like, looks like it's part of this if statement, but it's not. The if statement only controls the next line. So, right, scroll that back over. Seconds were not odd, but even though this was indented, it still executed it because the if statement, when you don't put curly braces, only applies, only will execute the next block of code. Okay? I hope that's clear and why that's confusing. So, uh, David Buckley on YouTube. I'm going to pause and take some questions. Do you guys not get bank holidays off there? Seems unfair. Um... Next week, actually, um, we'll have off for Labor Day here in the United States. Too bad. On your way to work. Have a good one, Mr. Bad Sound. Got it. Finally got a job. Congratulations. We, we want to celebrate all the folks in our community when they get a job, when they advance their career. Kudos to you, uh, Mr. Bad Sound. I hope you have a great day and uh, enjoy your new job. Um, yes, Collateral Damage on Twitch says, I always wrap in curly braces because it can save you from these types of errors when more lines are added. You can get confusing. David Buckley on YouTube uh, agrees, saying curly braces helps to maintain readability. Totally agree. Geek Girl over on Twitch, big cheers, lots of hype for Mr. Bad Sound on YouTube and the new job. Absolutely. Big congratulations to you. Um, it, it's, it's important that it's important to me and why I host these streams 
that that you learn how to advance your career. You learn techniques, technology, um, programming skills that mean you're going to do better at building an application or building a system or managing a system. And when you can advance your career, when you when you can right find a new job, get promoted. That success is everything to me. That that is so important to me that you're successful. You're you're taking your learning and you're achieving more. And that's all that all of us really ask for is I want to figure out how to do more, how to accomplish more. And when you can do that, I think that's a, a success that we can all celebrate. And we should all together help each other achieve more. So thank you for sharing that that update. Um, and yeah, we we definitely want to celebrate that. <laughs> David Buckley says, promotion, what's that? You spend 10, for your first 10 years, it seems like in a dungeon. Oh, that's terrible. No, no, no. No, no, no. Um, yes. So, Boss Fighter X on Twitch asks, is there a question mark possibility with this statement? We're going to get there. We're going to get there in just a little bit. Spoiler alert! It's a little bit further, a little bit further down here. When I scroll down to it, we're absolutely going to get to that. So, totally agree with you, and we'll get there in just a, a few seconds, a few minutes. So, let's take a look at some more complex branching scenarios. So, we can do else if statements. So, not only do we have the el the if, where we're going to do our initial test in parentheses here, but we can also include one to many additional else if statements. Seconds are even. Seconds are a multiple of three. Seconds are a multiple of five. Seconds are neither multiple of, uh, are neither even nor a multiple of three. I should also have a multiple of five down there as well, but you get the point. Um, so what we're looking at there is if it fails this first test, it'll execute the next test. If it fails that test, it'll execute the next test. If it fails that test, then it will always execute this last block in the else, okay? If it passes any of these tests with the else if, then it'll execute that appropriate block next to it. I've also got some code here that says, right, we can wrap this up as one line statements. Let me step off here. So we can do the exact same thing with one lines. If seconds percent two e double equals zero, seconds are even, and so on and so forth with those same else ifs without doing curly braces right a little bit cleaner way to see this a little bit easier for our human eyes to read compared to up here where we see this this kind of stack happening and it's it's a little bit messier um messier in the sense that your eyes are bouncing back and forth both of these blocks are going to be executed by the C-sharp compiler, by the .NET runtime, they'll be executed the same way. You're going to get the same code. It's strictly a matter of coding style for you, whether you prefer it in this format or in this format, okay? So when I execute this, current seconds is 25, and they both report seconds are a multiple of 5. I'll run it again. 32, it's even. 35, 36, 37 seconds are neither even nor a multiple of three. Okay. Um, so there we go. 45 seconds are a multiple of five. Awesome stuff, right? Easy to see how it's stepping through and, and pivoting back and forth between these if else if statements. Let me take a look back at chat and catch up here. Um... So, yep, we're going to get to the ternary in just a little bit. Absolutely. Um, it scrums, we're going to get to switch statements in just a little bit. We're, we're just introducing, looking at, <clears throat> and learning how to use if statements. We're going to learn about switch statements and ternary in just a little bit. Uh, let's see. Boss Fighter says, I thought we only use switch for 100 plus possibilities. <laughs> That's a lot of possibilities. Um, there's other ways to do that when you have quite so many 
possibilities and and clauses that you may might need to run through um, a more functional way to do that as well Sadie over on YouTube says my organization standard is to use braces curly braces to make the code more readable I completely agree with you Sadie while while this it it looks beautiful that's very easy to read um this is readable and it's also kind of kind of safe i'm not going to run into issues with accidentally running some extra code <clears throat> i even like to go one further when i see a block of code like this i like to put spaces between my my curly brace and the start of the code my code and the end of the block where the closing brace is so i actually like to have my code look like that so it's got a little bit of breathing room around it my eyes can more easily pick out and read what's inside of there instead of it kind of running together once again how you manage spaces how you lay that out it's strictly a human consideration but i'm going to agree with sadie on youtube that the braces do make it a little bit more readable and a little bit more acceptable It can look messy, David, but that's why I put spaces around it to make it a little bit clearer. Um, yes, people can set up style cop to help enforce some of the formatting here, some of the style for you. And you can also use um, Roslyn analyzers to help with that as well. Are recursion functions part of this lesson? I wasn't going to touch on recursion. Um... But we're, we're doing looping, so, I mean, we can show a little bit of that. Some people do get opinion, opinionated on curly brace placement. Yes, right? Some folks like it at the end of the line here. Move that. At the end of the... Stop it! <laughs> at the end of the line here. Some folks like it on a new line. So that you end up with a format like this. Uh, there we go. Right. Now, right, we just took what was, what, five, ten lines of code and turned it into almost 20 lines of code just because we put braces on new lines. That's okay. It's, it, it's up to you what makes most sense for how you read your code. Okay. K&R style for you, mainly because it's what you first learned. That's just fine. Um, some people like it at the end of the line. Some people like it the wrong way. <laughs> the, the hover hint is only because I left my mouse there, right? Just mousing through, no big deal. But because I left it there, the hints popped up. That's okay. So, all right. Um, you feel like you're under the esoteric regime of Microsoft documentation? <laughs> nah, Microsoft documentation is pretty good. Pretty good. Um, all right, let me move on here a little bit. So, if, else, if, and else statements help you control the flow of that. So, um, right, so there it is as a class string calculate message. And now I can execute and do the exact same thing, but it's inside of a class now, inside of a method to go and do that interaction. Piece of cake. Piece of cake. It, the exact same code. You can just move it inside of your method call and control flow how it reports and interacts with that. Um, now, what if we have a compound scenario where you want to test for multiple factors? There we go and determine which branches to take. So we, we want to get into logical or, logical and operators. So logical or is the vertical pipe character. Logical and is the ampersand character. So when you do those types of tests, right? Now we can say, well, let's test for both multiples of two and multiples of three by saying if seconds percent two and seconds percent three equals zero, 
Seconds are even and a multiple of three. And if either one of those is false, if it's not even or it's not a multiple of three, then it will start falling down into these other else statements, right? If it's even, report that. If it's a multiple of three, report it that way. And we can even add some additional ones down here. Some folks were asking about. So let's do, well, if seconds percent five is zero, so if it's a multiple of five or it's a multiple of seven, then we can output seconds are a multiple of five or seven, right? That vertical pipe says, uh, if this is true or this is true, we will report that. Otherwise, seconds are neither even nor a multiple of, that should be seven. Um, no, uh, neither even nor multiple of three uh, or all the other ones, five and seven in there as well. I'll execute that. So 41, 41 is not any of those multiples. 46 is even, 48, there you go even and a multiple of three. So it's walking through and choosing those branches appropriately. Okay? So that's a little bit of how you can use or and and. We're gonna get in a little bit more to some other things you can do with or and and um, testing your code. So, all right. Let me take a look here. Just keeping an eye on the clock. Let me come back to the chat room here. Um, let me see. Do, 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 do. Yeah, uh, banana, we're going to show that in just a little bit. That's different. Um, we're going to see how we can use... Um, what it, it, it's, it's... Is it or else? And, and I forget. It, it's written here. We're going to see that in just a second. Uh, can we do values in a list of values? Asks Johnny B. Cat. Um, if you want to test against a list of values, you can use some link statements like contains um, to, to execute against that list and see, does this contain these values? You can also use any and you can use all link statements, link methods to interact with a collection. Um, they are technically different. That's right, collateral damage. We're going to talk about that. I believe it's next. Um, Orlando Brown, how you doing there? I, I have, was always thought having all of these if statements are a code smell. You are correct. It is a code smell. We're showing the basics here of, of how these features work. So while it's, while in the long term for maintenance, it's not having many, many if and else if statements is not easy to maintain. We want to show these are things that you can do, you can work with them. Um, instead of having many if and else if statements, there's other ways to minimize branching and to make it a little bit more abstract so that it will, your code can choose better paths through the, uh, the path, through the, through the application to work with. Yep, we're gonna do some short circuit operators here in just a little bit. You can do that for bit by bit comparison. You can use the same operators for bit by bit, um, but we're using them as the logical here. Um, you're welcome, o o OK Bat Games. I hope I pronounced that right. No, no problem. Please don't apologize because I, I love seeing the enthusiasm about some of the next topics we're gonna get to. Um, so here we go. Um, here, the conditional logical and right here. It, it's referred to as and also in Visual Basic. So when you see the double ampersand operator, what it's going to do, and, and this is a short circuiting operator. In other words, it's going to evaluate the left side, okay? If that evaluates to false, stop immediately, return false, no further processing. Don't even look at what's on the right side. Otherwise, if it is true, well, let's evaluate the right side of the operator and whatever the right side of that evaluates to will then return and, and process appropriately. So if the left side is true, evaluate the right side and return whether that was true or false, okay? Let's take a look a little bit further here. So I'm going to create this time a method called multiple of three. 
Simple. Return if seconds percent three equals zero. That's a Boolean, right? That's a true or false. So return seconds percent three equals zero. And we're also going to display multiple of three was called. I'm going to create and write these two statements. If seconds percent two equals zero and multiple of three, then display seconds are even and a multiple of three. But notice I'm using the short circuiting and also operator. If seconds does not equal null and seconds percent two equals one. So it's odd display seconds are odd. Let me show you what happens with this. Uh, do it. Come on, give me the even. Here we go. So there. Current seconds is 26. Okay. That's an even. In the first test here. Oh, darn it. It's going to test if it's even and if multiple of three. Because it was even, it did execute multiple of three. So we got the multiple of three was called. It failed that and still reported, well, it would have reported seconds are odd. Okay. So execute this again. Seconds are odd. Seconds are odd. So even, and it called multiple of three, even though it failed, right? Um, now, if I change that to not short circuit, right? I change it to the standard at there. So even though it failed the first test, 25, clearly it's, it's odd. So it fails the left side. It still executes the right side, okay? So you're seeing visually how it is executing the various sides. It failed the uh, failed the test because it's 43. It's an odd number, and it did not execute. So we're short circuiting. Okay, we're not executing the tests on the right side. That's going to save you processor cycles, especially if you've got some really complex tests in your if statements. Okay. So keep an eye out for that. Let me scroll down here and take a look. Um, yes, vb.net, it's it's end and out end also. That's correct. And we'll see that here. Um, I mentioned those. Um, continuing. Make myself smaller in screen. Yes, I know I'm covering like 50%, so I can reach all the way over here. I know. I've, I've spent a lot of time setting this up. I know. <laughs> um, and, and I work with that. So, um, all right. You're very welcome, Betten Course. Thank you. Um, let me see here. That's right. I'm not showing the entire screen, Kira. You have the entire source code available to you. I've made it completely available for folks to download. So. And does do bitwise as well. Yes, we're working with the logical tests. So, all right. Continuing on. Um, yep, I explained the multiple of three. All right, so now we can do the exact same thing with a logical or using conditional logical or using double vertical pipe. So now that's also called or else. So and also and or else, right? Or else is this operator. So once again, same type thing, evaluate the left side. If the left side evaluates to true because this is an or operation, return true, stop processing. Otherwise, if the left side of the operator is false, return the, uh, the result of the right side of the operator. So it's just the reverse of what we saw with the double ampersand. Double vertical pipe is an or, and we're only gonna execute the right side if the left side is false. Let's do a similar example now. So here we go. Current seconds, right, same thing. Multiple of three was called. And here we're going to do if seconds percent two. So if it's even or it's a mod multiple of three, seconds are even or a multiple of three. Now it's only going to execute the right side 
if it's an odd number. Okay, and I'll do that. So 42, it is uh, even or a multiple or three. Let me run again. 47, it's odd. It's still executed multiple of three. 53, multiple of three was called. 55, 56, right? So we'll get to, come on, give me three. There we go. Multiple of three was called. Seconds or even or a multiple of three, right? It's It shows the difference between the two. And once again, if I take that down to just a single pipe, it always executes both sides. It'll always execute multiple of three regardless, okay? Even when it's um, even, it still executes it. When I have the double vertical pipe, it will not execute for even numbers. There it is, okay? So once again, saving processor cycles. You don't need to evaluate the right side because the left side is true already. So that entire statement is true. Yes, we are going to get to switch expressions in just a little bit. Uh, Pablo on YouTube asks. So. <laughs> All right. Let me scroll down here. We're going to talk about pattern matching next. This is a feature that was recently added to um, to .NET, to, I'm sorry, to C Sharp, so that you can go through and test that things match the same shape of an object, okay? And you assign that value then to a variable that you can continue to work with. So if we have a class called orange, and orange has a method that says make juice, and if we have a class called apple, and apple has a method called make pie. Fantastic, I love a good apple pie. Love a nice glass of orange juice. Orange juice is okay, but I like my coffee. So I'll have an object that's a, we'll call that variable uh, fruit. It's an object that we can work with here. And we'll test, well, is this object an apple? If it is an apple, so right, fruit is apple. And we declare then the variable we want to, uh, we want to, insert that into we want to convert and place it into it'll go into the a variable here so then i can say a dot make pie else if the fruit is orange and we'll put it into a variable called o o dot make juice otherwise if i don't know what this is well i, I don't know what to do with this fruit so let's make this an apple and making apple pie if i turn it into an orange of course, where'd it go? Right? Execute it again, making orange juice. So it's testing the shape. It's testing that this object is that class, is that type, okay? And putting it into that variable so that you can further work with it, all right? That's pattern matching at its simplest here as we go through and talk about some of the basics of this. Now, somebody was asking a little bit earlier, hey, can we use ternaries for this? Yes. So in C Sharp, just like in other languages, we have the question mark colon ternary conditional operator. There we go. So you'll see question mark colon, and you can put on one line then, if this is true, question mark, yes, do this thing, colon, it was false, do something else. All right, so we can use that to to quickly test and assign values. I'll show you that in a second. Let me take a look back at chat and let's get caught up. I keep an eye on my clock here. Uh, will this be left as a recorded session? Yes, it will. Um, yep. If pattern matching's new to you? Yeah, there's a lot more to pattern matching that I that I'm not getting into right now, but there's a lot of content out there. Um, did I provide a link to the doc? Yes, I did. So you can click through and learn a whole lot more right here if you, you click this link to the pattern matching all in the official documentation. So the ternary conditional operator. So now somebody was asking earlier, well, can I do that that same seconds test with, with the ternary? And here it is. So the current seconds are, and I'm just going to output the number of seconds. So I laid out this statement. So var result equals seconds percent two equals zero. So if that is true, even. 
Otherwise, if it's false, and see, I even put the little comment notes here. If it's false, the text odd, display the result. It does the exact same thing, but it's in one line. It's an assignment to a value. This is another way for you to do conditional interaction and assignment with two variables. Pretty cool. All right, so odd. And there we go, and there it's even, okay? Options, this is all about options, different ways that you can write code that, accomp that really do accomplish the same thing, okay? I have another block here. You can chain together your conditional operators as well. So, we can say not just, here's the current number of seconds, but look at this, we can get really crazy, right? And this, is, this isn't even that crazy. If per seconds percent if seconds are even question mark we're going to do another test well if seconds um mod three are zero so if they're a multiple of three even and multiple of three and there's even more content over here look at this so if they're if they fail the multiple of three test they're even and this is the if it failed the uh, even test will we'll output odd. All right. So then I have down here var multiple of three, right? And even n multiple of three. You can see that same interaction. Okay. So cool. Easy to see and work through here. All right. Let me skip down. Next is null coalescing operator. This is one that's a little bit tricky for for folks to understand. I'm going to take a look. I see some more messages coming into chat. Um, I'm glad you enjoy the teaching approach, Kira. Everything should be written on one line, says 3D Polywraith. Um, right? That's what we get when we minify our JavaScript. Everything is on one really long line. And you have to wrap in order to see it in your text editor, right? Turn on text wrap. Um, uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. you have to take care that always put the first statement, the option that will be most probable. Yes, that's right. Uh, Robosa on, on Twitch points out if, if you can make your, your first half of your conditional operators with the short circuit, if you make that the most common result, that second half will execute less than they, than it typically should, right? You'll, you'll save a lot of processor cycles. Yes. Um, can you call a class member for true or false? Yes, to return values. Certainly. Right? So um, if I had... I don't have a class here. Um, so if, if I had another function here... Um, right, so let's create... This is going to return string. Check multiple of three and we'll receive uh, seconds right and if I did this right um, in here I could say uh, check multiple of three seconds fine there you go and so instead right and I was kind of in front of that so I can call that method to do additional evaluation decide what to place here and it still works absolutely you can do these things it's a question of what makes the most sense for your coding style um, uh, hello uh, Monty Balan welcome in um, all right, let's get into this. Let's get a little bit further. Null coalescing operator. So the null coalescing operator is a simpler way. The double question marks is a simpler way to write this. My value, some sort of a test value, does not equal null. If it does not equal null, then output that test value. Otherwise, do something else. So it's a shortcut 
to turn this into that. So if my value is, and we'll start off with my value equals null. And if I say display my value, question mark, question mark, null coalescing. So if it is null, this is the value to report. It's null. If I make it a real value, now it outputs test. It's displaying my value because my value is not null. It defaults to my value test. Okay. So once again, it's a way to shorthand write that statement, right? So um, let's see. Let's update this slightly. Let's call this var output so that it has the same contents here. Uh, some other value. Okay. So now the variable name my value lines up here. My value does, if this is the same as my value does not equal null, it'll output my value. Otherwise, some other value and instead I provided it's null. Okay. Let me take a look at chat. Let's get caught up. Can I explain more about per sec seconds percent two equals zero seconds percent three? Sure. Let me go back up. So that was in here. Right. Uh, I'll leave that there. Um, uh, I'm going to comment that. Uh, I want to have both of these statements is what I'm trying to do. I'll grab this and drop that in. There we go. Good. So the question is, can I explain more about that statement? And it wraps and it's really long here. So I'm going to actually put this on multiple lines to make it a little bit clearer. Okay. So this is saying to, this is, uh, Hisumatsu is asking about this. So this is saying, first, test if the seconds percent two, if the seconds divided, number of seconds on the clock right now, divided by two equal, has a leftover value of zero. So if it's even, if it's an even number of seconds, question mark so if that's true if we're even the, so the number of seconds is 12 right then it's going to execute the first block here which is another test well if se if that same number of seconds percent three equals zero so divide that number of seconds divide 12 by three and if we get a leftover of zero so 12 divided by three is perfectly four with no remainder so then uh, right, so that's true. So in the case of 12, we'll output this message, even n multiple of three. That That's what will be assigned to result. Otherwise, right, if if this is false, so if it's, if it's 14, let's say, right, that is a leftover of two. Well, false, so it's just even, okay? But if the number of seconds is 13, right? 13% two, well, that has a leftover of one. It's not gonna execute this line. It'll drop right into odd, okay? So I hope that explains a little bit more walking through all of that. Um, this is C-sharp, Crazy Mang. So, yep, says it in the title. Um, C-sharp with C-sharp Fritz. And uh, we've also got the tag turned on over on YouTube, so we know it's C-sharp. All right, let's take a look-see. Glad to hear it, uh, Hisamatsu. I hope I, I hope I pronounce your name correctly. So, all right, we talked about null coalescing. Null conditional is another little trick you can do. Question mark dot. And you can use this to check, well, if the value is null, don't advance. Don't execute the rest of this statement. 
I've got a link here to the official documentation if you want to check that out. Early in the development of this operator was sometimes referred to as the Elvis operator um, because it, it looks like a little curly hair thing above two eyes. So um, we can take a look here. I created a student object. So we'll create a new student with the name of Fritz and we'll display our student's name is S question mark dot name. So if S is null, it won't execute and output the name. Our student's name is, but we, we can even chain together some of these. So we can say our student's name is, and check this out, S question mark dot name. So if it doesn't, if S, if the student is not assigned, if we don't have a student object, if that's null, it's not going to execute the name pro uh, property check here. But because we'll use the null coalescing operator, because S is null, we'll then get a little block of text here. Student is not assigned yet. So our student's name is Fritz. Now, if I go back up here and I make this null, see, because I did S question mark name, I don't get an error when it when S is null. Down here, because I'm doing, well, S question mark name, this turns into null because it's not processing. Since S is null, this returns null. Well, since that is null, because we saw the, the right, make sure I say these names right, the null coalescing operator, it's gonna output student is not assigned yet. Our student's name is student is not assigned yet. A little bit tricky way to handle nulls and work around them with these two operators. And if you've seen some of one of my other sessions, you've seen there's ways that we can turn off the value null entirely from our C-sharp code by enabling the nullability features. That video is available here on YouTube. If you're looking on YouTube, if you're watching the recording, check it out. You can see more about how we can work with nulls and reduce, even eliminate nulls in our code in C-sharp. Taking a look back at chat. Let me get caught up here. <laughs> That's Mr. C Sharp Fritz to you. Well, thank you. Um, so, um, is Elvis similar to the double question mark? No, no. Rita Schultz in from Berlin. Welcome in, Rita. Hello. Thanks for joining us. I see some other folks joining us on YouTube. Hello, hello. Um, um, Musalim says they use null coalescing to check values coming from HTTP client results. Right, you're making a request from some other source, some other location that you don't have control over. HTTP client is great for interacting with microservices, other web services that you may be interacting with, and you don't know some of the data that's coming back from there. You're not managing that. And if, if some null value comes in that you need to be able to handle, using some of the null coalescing, some of the null conditional operators are gonna help you to inter to get around them without hitting an issue. Because if I have, if S here, if my student is null and I don't include the question mark here, and I execute, look at that. Oh, the dreaded null reference exception. Sorry, object reference is not set. You tried to do something to null. So we use that question mark and the double question mark for null coalescing to get around and prevent accidentally interacting with a null value. Interacting with null, trying to do something with it is never successful. Do you have to use double question mark, null coalescing operator with the null conditional? The question mark period asks Max over on YouTube. Max, thanks for the question. No, you do not have to use them together. Um, it's just a nice, it's a nice convenient way to kind of set a default there. Okay, um, I'm I'm using the the uh, null conditional operator there to reference a property, but you may be using it to reference a method, and instead of executing the method, it'll just stop. It won't do anything. Right, so if I if I put another method here, um, so uh, uh, if we call this hello, and we just return 
world, right? Um, so down here, our student's name is student whatever. But I, if I said display, right, um, s dot hello, right? So it returns null. It didn't do anything. It didn't fail. If we do have a student, it returns world. So you can now conditionally interact with those methods to do something, okay? And it'll return null. It won't do anything if that object is null. So you have choices. These are, right, these are different ways that you need to figure out how you want your code to interact and, and the um, null conditional and null coalescing operators help provide a little bit of safety around that. Thank you so much for that question, Max. Really good question. Um, uh, OK Bat Game says, a new way to null check. Very useful for their game dev. Thanks so much, Boss Fritz. You're welcome. Best of luck to you with your game development. Um, let us know how you're doing. If, if you're working with Unity, drop me a line. I'd be interested to take a look and see how you're doing with that. Um, how we doing here? I see a couple new folks joining us. Um, guten Nachmittag, Rita. Welcome in. Um, all right. Yes, it does work with indexers as well, Amal. Yes. So I haven't gotten into indexers here, but you can absolutely use it with the question mark, uh, with the square brackets. Now, some folks were asking about switch statements. How do we do switch statements? When we have a lot of if else, if else if statements, can't we do a switch instead? Yes, I've got documentation linked here if you want to go learn more. But in the typical case of working with C Sharp, you're going to see these statements, switch, case, break, and default. So you're going to use switch with some sort of test expression in parentheses to perform your test. The output of that test, you're going to apply and, and decide where to branch off to with a series of case in parentheses, whatever that result is you want to test against, colon. And those statements will provide those branching paths. At the conclusion of one of those, you need to include a break. Otherwise, a break statement. Otherwise, it will fall out and we need a default branch at the bottom to ensure that if none of your cases are matched, do something else instead. So let's look at a real example. Here we go, day of the week. So if date time, now, day of the week, here's the thing, I always present these streams um, on Mondays. So this is always gonna return Monday. It's true. Um, so I can force it and say, well, day of the week equals Friday. I'm gonna comment that out for right now um, because Right, we'll just override and test it differently. So based on what day of the week it is, we will switch. So switch day of the week. If day of the week is Monday, display. Does somebody have the case of the Mondays? If it's Tuesday, taco Tuesday, etc., cetera, et cetera, okay? So very simple way to switch case and go through all these different scenarios. Um, by default, if we don't match any of these days of the weeks, I don't know, I don't care what day of the week it is, it's a holiday. Simple. And it's Monday. <clears throat> if I override that and make it some other day of the week, so we'll make it Friday, the weekend starts now. All right? That's the statement we had inside of there. But notice the, the structure here. We're doing our test investigate this value and if it equals this colon execute this block of code break stop don't continue processing okay now we can add additional case tests for case statements using a when clause so we can say not just and here we'll do a little bit of falling fall through on these right so case this case that case this notice no breaks in between them so it falls through to the next one so if it is monday tuesday wednesday thursday or friday when the hour of day is less than 16 right so hour of day is another value we're going to grab here 
we're going to display work, work, work. So when it's less than 4 p.m. But when it's Friday, it, right, case Friday, when hour of day is greater than or equal to 16, the weekend starts now. Case Saturday, Sunday, relaxing, no school, no work. Execute that, and I get work, 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 because it's Monday, and here where I am, right, we're 10 a.m. in the morning. So it doesn't even get into this when statement here. So, um, right, if I change this to Friday, Fritz, it's Fritz Day. If we change that to Friday, execute again, so it's Friday, it's 5 p.m., the weekend starts now. If I change that back, let's make it 7 a.m. on Friday, we're still working, okay? Typical work week types of type of scenario there that you can tinker with and you could see I hope you see how it falls through between these be, be, between these conditions and use the when to provide a secondary test here. Let me take a look back at the chat room and get caught up. Um, how we do in there? Uh, can I have the link to the documentation that I'm presenting? Um, can somebody share the the GitHub link? So glad you like the t-shirt there, uh, Young Lee. Um, definitely in case of the Mondays. Thank you so much, Hisamatsu, for sharing the link. Make a Blazor course? Already did it. It's in the playlist. Check it out in the playlist. There is a Blazor cor course available. We've got lots of material about Blazor and more coming. Um, hard language cannot understand, says Lakshmisha. Um, okay. Um, do you have to list all the cases? What if you miss a day in your cases? Sure. So let's let's take a look at what happens with that. So I'm going to comment this out so it goes with, right, and it just uses the current day of the week. And if I didn't include Monday up here, right, what happens? Nothing. I didn't include all of the cases and I chose and I'm executing one of those cases that doesn't exist and it, it didn't return anything, it didn't do anything. That may make sense for your code to say, well, if it doesn't match any of these scenarios, don't do anything, right? Maybe you're doing some sort of an error handler. You're inspecting, you're, there was a comment earlier about getting data from an HTTP service. You're getting data from an API. Maybe you're getting, maybe you're getting the, the latest video from, from a YouTube API. Hey, go tell me what that is. And you wanna check, let's say you wanna check the tags on that YouTube video. Sometimes folks don't assign tags to their videos, and that's okay. But if you go to inspect those tags and you want to pivot and do something with it, well, you might have some some statements here that says, well, if tag, right, if tags are these values, do this. Well, if it doesn't match any of them because there are no tags set, do nothing. And that's okay. That might be appropriate for your application. You might want to raise an error or, or do something else or set a default value. Cool. You can, right? It's all about giving you options and choices how you want your application to work. Um, yep, when means when, Mr. N the Best asks on, on Twitch. That's right. When is literally an additional case, an adi not additional case, an additional test that you're applying to that case statement not just case this value matches the test up up top but when do this other test as well correct um what's the speed like when using switch case like this compared to a handful of if else if similar very similar um hey chris gomez yes we're going to get into the new switch expression as well that's coming up just a little bit down below um switch which which performs better switch statement or switch expression same you, you would literally need to be executing billions of these in within a few seconds of each other to see any kind of performance issue it, it's pretty much the same can we replace when with an ampersand to do a logical and test asks pablo on youtube Pablo, good question. Doesn't quite work that way because we're we're 
trying to test against a single value, right? So we can't say, right, even if this was, uh, let me change this back to when, and let's put something, oh, darn it. Go back, down, down, do, 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 do. I hit the home key on my keyboard instead of page up. Uh, do, 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 do. There it is. So, right, if I want to, it was the next sample, down here, right? So, if I had, uh, yeah, that's right, right, and, uh, hey, you, come back here, right? If I wanted to do, um, Friday, uh, and hour of day less than 16, that, that doesn't work. That's an invalid syntax because it's it's testing against that value okay um and it it doesn't know what to do to join these together so we do when to provide that additional oh, i hit home and it went up oh man there we go taking me outside the box into the rest of the document when I hit home. So there we go. Right, let me put Monday back in there. And now, it, there we go. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a nested test. Good point. Uh, am I going to cover design patterns a little bit further down, a few weeks out? Can you use and after when? Yes. So when you're providing that additional test here, I can say when hour of day greater than or equal to 16 and, uh, uh, I don't know, and false, right? You, you can do that type of syntax. Yes. It's right before the when, when you're testing against the value on the select, uh, on the switch, I'm sorry, on the switch here, it's a select in, in SQL and VB. Um, but when you're doing the switch on inspect this value, match it against one of these, that's when you do when with your additional tests here for when this value matches that, when and your additional condition. Okay. Can you have two whens at one time? No, you would want to you would want to do these types of concatenating, concatenating together those conditions. So, all right. Um, so now there was a comment. Well, you can also use switch expressions. Let's talk about switch expressions. <laughs> it's, it's like you knew what the next paragraph in the document was. Here it is, switch expressions. I've got links to the official documentation here. So what if we want to interact and assign a variable type? So let's do something very similar here using the switch keyword. So switch, right? We've got var day of week, day of now, day of week, display the day of week. Now, um, I'm going to enable this. Take that and put it back up there. So now, right, I'm going to take day of week. And right, so var message equals day of week switch. Okay, so we've turned around the syntax here. Look at this. So day of week is the is what we are switching and testing on. Okay, instead of switch parentheses value to test, no, we're saying day of week switch. So inspect this value and make a decision of what to do with it. Curly braces around the block of our conditionals. If it's Monday, right, so if day of week matches this, fat arrow, so Monday such that, and here's the value we're going to assign to message, okay? It returns this into there. If it's Friday, this, otherwise, and we always need a default statement. You always, with a switch expression, need the underscore default statement, okay? So underscore says, it, it underscores a discard in C sharp. It says, well, ignore this. So if if day of week is something else, then default statement. And I can display message here. Right? Execute. Uh, oh no! What? 
What? What? What happened there? Day of week equals daytime now. Day of week. Oh, I know what this is. I know what this is. Um. Yeah. This is something that it doesn't know how to do because the version of, yeah, the version of C Sharp in the notebooks doesn't support this yet. Um, yeah, so this doesn't actually work. <laughs> mm. um, but this is the syntax you would be using for that. Notice there's commas at the end of the selected values. So you need to use a slightly different format. Um, that's why it was commented out because it doesn't work here in, um, in the notebooks. Let me go back to chat real quick here. What about a sp switch expression with two values? Um, at that point, you're, you're getting a little bit out of what you're trying to do with a switch. You're trying to inspect one value. So maybe that, that one value is a class, right? Maybe that value is a reference type. It's not just day of the week and you want to inspect the values on it. You can do that then. So, uh, looking further at chat, when was this version of Switch put in? I believe it's C-sharp 9. It was added. Um, C-sharp 8, and it, for some reason it doesn't work here in, uh, in the notebook. Yeah, I'm sorry, C-sharp 8, um, but it does not work in the notebook. So... It looks like um, the null conditional with more, not null conditional, the ternary expression with more com possibilities. Yes. When was the when added? A while ago. At least C sharp seven. So that'll, that should be available to you. All right, I'm gonna move on to for loops. For loops are a pretty standard thing that you see in many programming languages. I have a link to the documentation there on for loops, but you'll see syntax that is generally of this structure. For, some initializer, some condition, and an iterator. How, how are you iterating? Um, and a block, a code block inside of curly braces for the code to execute. An initializer typically initializes a counter variable to work with, um, condition is that test to so that it knows when to stop operating and uh, as long as condition is true it'll continue to execute the, the block and the iterator is what you're going to change at the conclusion of each step through the loop so you'll typically see this syntax for var counter equals zero when counter is less than five, counter plus plus, increment it. So then we'll say display counting and whatever the counter value is, and we get counting zero through four. Why didn't we get counter counting five? We didn't get counting five because when it got to five, the next loop that it would have sent through here, well, counter is not less than five, so it doesn't execute the loop. Okay. Will this work in Visual Studio 2022? Yes, it will. Yep. Everything that I'm showing you here will work in Visual Studio 2022. It will work with .NET 5. It'll work with .NET 6. It'll work with .NET Core 3.1. Not all of it. Uh, switch expressions won't work with .NET Framework 4.8, but everything else will work with .NET Framework. Uh, pattern matching will work with it as well, with 4.8. All right, so we can even count backwards. We can change that iterator. So instead of it being plus plus, we can say counter equals five, go until counter while counter is greater than zero. And we're gonna say counter minus equals three. So not just step one, but take three off. And when we execute this time, counting five, counting two, and when it takes three off of that again, it'll be minus one. Well counter is not greater than zero 
So it stops after those two iterations. So depending on how you need to count, how you need to iterate, how many times you need to execute your loop, you can control it by changing your iterator and changing your test condition of when to execute that loop. Um, the display statement that you see here, that is a notebooks command that is effectively the same as console.writeline. Um, it behaves a little bit differently when you are um, interacting with reference types, uh, classes, it'll actually lay out and specify here's all the properties for them. And there's other, um, there's other display formatters for other types that will output other display shapes and definitions of things for you when you're working here in the notebook. So it's not quite a replacement for console rate line, but it is native and only available in notebooks. You can write infinite loops, yes. So I, I don't have this one executing here. I didn't want to actually have it run, but var counter equals one. While counter is greater than zero, counter plus plus, and it'll just execute this infinitely. You can enable this and run it if you'd like. Be ready to kill your notebook. I'm not going to run it here. We're, we've got about 13 minutes left in the session. I'm going to pass on that. So we can also break our for loops. We can have them stop if some other condition happens. So that same infinite loop that I had earlier, counter equals one while counter is greater than zero, counter plus plus, I can say, well, if counter is greater than 10, break. And that will stop the loop right there. And you've seen this probably in other languages. Break is a pretty common thing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now notice it executed the 11th time because that was true. It wasn't until it got here that it stopped. So we do still get it saying counting 11. Um, for each loops are what we're going to talk about next. I'm going through this a little bit quickly, I'm, I know, because um, we're running out of time. Uh, yes, it might not execute the loop at all. Yep. Um, if I started the infinite loop task manager to get out alive. Oh, yeah. You're right. So. All right. Um, so you can do four each to iterate over a collection and interact with all the values of that collection. I'm realizing here, that's not how you spell Myra. Myra, there we go. Um, so if I have a collection of names, so here's an array, new string, double bracket says this is an array, and in curly braces I have, here's all the items in my array. So I have Fritz, Scott, Maria, let's put a character return there so you can see more, Jamie, Myra, and James, put some names in there. So now for each, it's one word, for each, var name in that collection of names. So it's going to step through the names array here and it's going to stop for each item. When it does, that value, Fritz, is going to be put into the name variable and will execute this block. So I'll say display name and it'll contain Fritz and it'll continue through to the next, Scott, Maria, etc and it'll stop when it hits the end of the array. And there they are. So for each is a lot safer to pre prevent against infinite loops. It executes for each item in that collection and we're doing an array collection here. We're gonna learn more about collections in one of the weeks ahead. You love the for each, Johnny B Cat, I do too. Um, for each works with any enumerable type, any collection type, uh, Hisamatsu. So you can uh, you can run it against lists, you can run it against queues, you can run it against um, dictionaries, and it will go through and inspect each item of that collection. You'll sometimes hear .NET folks refer to a collection as an enumerable type. Okay. Uh, all right. Is recursion faster than for loops? Not necessarily, no. Uh, for each with enumerable dot range is almost like a for loop, yes. Didn't want to get into enumerable, but yes, that works as well. 
What is the difference between four loops and four each loops if they can do the same in loops with length? Um, they can do the same, but instead of doing a four loop, passing in some sort of a counter, um, you're passing in an array, a collection, right? And inspecting each item of that collection. You don't have to go and count the number of items in that collection. It'll do that for you behind the scenes. It won't even count them. It'll just run until it hits the end of the collection. It doesn't even count the size of the collection. So you're doing a little bit of extra code there. Um, how do you get authentication code in Core Web API? I'm sorry, that's off topic, Jake. I'm not going to answer that. There's uh, there's some other folks. Check out the 425 show. I believe they're tomorrow on on the Visual Studio channel on Twitch, and they can help you out with that. Um, it's a little bit too far off topic for this discussion. So it is functionally the same. There, to that question of, well, isn't the for each and the four the same? It's functionally the same, but look, I need to get the length of the collection and manage this counter object. So you're allocating actually a couple more variables. You're, you're executing this length here. So you're, you're executing just a few more things. You can do this. This is completely valid. You're executing just a few more things that really, in, in, when you're dealing with a collection of six items, who cares? But um, they're functionally the same. So it's a question of style at that point, okay? If you're working with billions of items and you need, you need all of them to execute very, very quickly, you might see a second or two difference between the two styles. Might. Doubtful you will, though. Uh, what happens if the collection is null? So if I go back up here, if this is null, uh, well, like that, right? It's going to error out saying, well, cannot assign null to an implicitly typed variable. Uh, well, that's, right, if this is, let's do this, right? If I do it like that, null reference exception. If it's empty, right? So if we have that, right? It executes, and since there's nothing in the collection, it doesn't do anything. So... Those are the couple of differences in how you interact with it. Uh, oops, forgot the bring that back in. There we go. So just some things to be aware of. Not bad. Your application may need one or the other of those. For each, enumerate the number of items beforehand, or is it testing for end of data on each loop? Uh, at the end of each at the end of each process, it checks to see at the end of each block execution, it checks to see if there's another item to process. What is the schedule of these? Does it happen every week? Yes. Every Monday, 9 a.m. Eastern, 6 a.m. Pacific. Uh, you'll find me over here broadcasting. And I think we're off next week because of the American holiday. We'll be off. And we'll be back the week after. So there's the four each. Um, these looping statements uh, also work with other reference types. So if we have our student type here, student name Fritz, of course, for each of our student, and look, you, you can see here, let me put some carriage returns in there so you can see that. Right, so there's another student, Mr. Anderson. Um, I thought Mr. Anderson was stuck in the matrix. But we can loop through that collection of students and interact with that property. There's Fritz and Mr. Anderson. Okay. How are we doing? About five minutes left here. All right. Um, where'd it go? Strings are character arrays. Consequently, we can iterate over each character in the string. So check it out. Var name equals Fritz. We can say for each var letter in name because a string is a character array. And if we say display letter... Right, it looks like we're cheering for me now. F-R-I-T-Z. There they are. Okay. Um, we can do the exact same looping capabilities with while and do loops. There's links to documentation here. 
there for the while loop and do loop real easy so you provide just the conditional while this executes and is true counter plus plus and display counter so when counter is six it doesn't actually do anything when counter is one there it goes and displays all the values so but in a while loop it's up to you to change that value to make this eventually return false otherwise while this is true it will continue executing if you never change what that test depends on what what this is investigating it will run forever and you'll have another infinite loop so the while executes the content i'm sorry runs the test then executes the content a do loop executes the content and see it has a while at the end so do this while and there's my test so it executes this then tests so if i make this four right so it, it executes it and five so it incremented it immediately to five and stopped processing versus up here when i make this uh four um it executed displayed tested and stopped processing and that's the end of this notebook all right let me take a look at chat real quick uh, will there be a new ma there will be a new Matrix movie I think it's is it this December we'll get a new Matrix movie um, are there pointers in C sharp like C++ yes um, and those are unsafe operations that you can use to interact with 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 uh, operating system pointers we talked last week about delegates and I think delegates might be a little bit more what you're referring to where we can have pointers to other methods right delegate captures a reference to a method elsewhere in our application and we can pass that delegate around to execute uh, yep i talked about the difference between them between while and do while um you're welcome johnny b cat <laughs> max t saying my name is neo we've got two minutes left let me head back over to the desk and we will call it a day. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Back over here, hello. Whew. How do you write C-sharp in Jupyter Notebooks? Check out the link to the repository, C-sharp with C-sharp Fritz. There is a link to that technology, to that capability, right at the root of, of the GitHub repository there. That'll tell you more about exactly how you can start up and run your own notebooks um live on on your machine it basically it, the the shortcut answer is uh visual studio code have the notebooks uh extension installed and you can say new notebook file new notebook and it'll work for you thank you so much everybody for tuning in one minute left here before we say goodbye to our friends on learn tv thank you so much for watching let me wrap things up here um this has been this has been a good stream i think we had a, a great time here covering all of our topics getting in talking about conditional statements about looping statements um we've got so much more great content ahead taking a look at the repository i have uh looking at next week we're going to talk about link and collections uh no i'm sorry next week is next week we're off then we're talking about collections and generics how we can work with not just an array, but with lists and dictionaries and hashed sets and how how you interact with those and what those mean inside of our code. The week after, we're going to be talking about link and all the cool stuff you can do with language integrated natural query. Really cool stuff. All those notebooks, all the content for all of our sessions are available on the GitHub repository. I encourage you, clone, download, get your hands on them, run them in your browser, tinker with it get a feel for the language it's going to help you and if you have questions please ask them just below on the youtube uh on the youtube video i'm happy to check out the recordings and reply to any any questions that are there and uh happy to answer on twitch and youtube live thank you so much everybody for watching those that were watching on dotnet live have a good one if you're watching on youtube 
thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you joining me. The recording will be available. It'll be available on youtube.com slash dot net. Check out the C Sharp with C Sharp Fritz uh, playlist over there. Yeah, that's right. It was my birthday over the weekend. Thank you so much. Those of you that are watching on Twitch, it's time for a raid. Oh, yeah. Uh, we're going to find somebody else who's streaming on the big Twitch TV network, and we're going to get you connected to go check out what else is going on out there. Somebody else who's writing code. Somebody else that's having a good time teaching and writing about uh, technology. And I'm taking a look. You know what? A friend of mine who's now a full-time independent video game developer... He's observing what he's calling Marketing Monday. We're going to go check out Tim Bodet from the Live Coders team. Thank you so much, friends, for joining me. I'll be back tomorrow over on my Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash c fritz We'll be talking about Blazer, RavenDB, building with Azure over there. I hope you tune in and join me 9 a.m. Eastern, 6 a.m. Pacific over on that channel. A big... Uh, message of support to our friends in Baton Rouge and Louisiana. The Baton Rouge user group sent me over this hat. All the best to you as you weather the storm. I hope you and yours have safety, take care, and have a have a good week ahead. All right, get ready to say hi to my friend Tim. Have a great rest of your day, and I will see you tomorrow on Twitch. Take care.